the first topic we're, topic we're going to cover is choosing where a bank. Places the bank can be like your traditional brick and mortar, like as I see here, Wells Fargo and Chase. Also credit unions like Alliant, and then also your uh, newer, the newer online banks. The various factors you want to consider before you decide on where to keep your money uh, are, the, are the following. So, and remember, it can be all at one place or it can be at many, many different places. Like I use uh, an online bank and a brick and mortar. So when choosing, you'll want to take into account the account fees, interest rates, where you can get cash from, such as ATMs, the types of, types of accounts offered, what online or mobile capabilities there are, and also the reputation of the bank. You can go directly to the institution's websites to, fill, to find out some of these details, but I do recommend sites that compare these details, such as I personally use bankrate.com or NerdWallet. Also, it's important to take into account whether your financial institution is FDIC uh, insured. What that means is that up to $250,000 of your money is insured by the government in the unlikely event that your bank goes bankrupt. You can see if your uh, institution self, excuse me, is FDI insured at, at FDIC.gov. So it's very important to have a financial institution to park your money because it costs nothing to deposit money and you can keep your money in the account. If you do not have a financial institution and receive a paycheck or any check for that matter, you can go to check cashing services or a payday lender to get cash, but they can charge anywhere from one to 10%, which I think you should have to do if you have a financial institution. Additionally, with almost all financial institutions, you can set up direct deposit, which is an electronic deposit to your bank from your paycheck. And then you can also uh, do other deposits to your mobile devices as well. So uh, uh, one of the most important factors in choosing a bank, and I, this is an interesting question real quick. H how many of you keep cash at home? Or maybe this is a, another level of crazy that's just from me because I'm in South Dakota, from South Dakota, but gold coins or, or gold bullion in a vault at home or something like that. I mean, one of the most important things about banking is, is the safety um, and if, if you do keep cash at home, you know, don't tell me how much or where you keep it, uh, but just pop into the chat and just let me know if you do. Uh, I, I'll tell you a story because I, I've known this, I've known this, uh, uh, this gentleman who's my best friend from high school, his nephew is, uh, he runs a body shop in Rapid City, South Dakota, meaning, meaning a, a car dealer, you know, they fix cars and he keeps, he has a bank account. It's convenient to pay bills with a bank account but he does not trust banks. Um, and he keeps literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in a safe at his house. Um, and I mention him because we have, we're sort of in an interesting moment in time uh, in our culture, he's Native American. And his, his history with the federal government and with banking institutions is not a positive one. So he, is, he has grown to not trust them. And there's been articles in the last week um, where people of color have written in and said, yeah, I don't, I don't invest in the stock market. I don't trust it. I do, I do insurance and I do CDs. Um, and it's interesting because this, there's a massive wealth gap that's been created. And this is potentially one of those issues is this trust issue that's at the base of this. Now, for our purposes, one of the foundations of, of banking and investing is trusting the banks and the custodians to hold their assets. Now, I believe they're trustworthy. I appreciate FDIC and SIPC insurance, um, but I also believe that we can trust the institutions themselves. It's in their best interests to not uh, lose their customers, us, a lot of money. Uh, that trust, it turns out, is a baseline part of enabling my own efforts to building my wealth for my family. Now, obviously, interest is nice, um, but almost non-existent at the moment and different banks offer different technologies and different integrations that allow you uh, to do more, to more easily integrate your, organize your finances. Um, but it's, it, 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 the baseline is that safety that comes from trust. Um, you know, I see people saying they, no one keeps it under the rug, in a wallet, a uh, couple bucks, some bucks at home. Um, we have a, a, not a bucket, I have a drawer in my house, you know, Eli busks and when he, when he busks, he, he gets, you know, many, 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 many ones and a whole bunch of change. So I've got a bucket that's full of change and I've got a drawer that's full of ones um, because, you know, we don't, I never go to the bank. And so how do you deposit cash? And I just simply don't use that much cash anymore. So uh, we just have this pile of ones that we can use occasionally. Um, 
So any account you open at any institution is going to require a lot of information. So, you know, things like social security, maybe you need a government ID, uh, the date of birth, current address. You may even have to, you know, come up with two or three past addresses to prove who you are. Phone number, email address. These are all ways or things that the bank is going to use to verify who you are to, to uh, uh, open an account. Now, we mentioned this earlier. If, if you've ever had a problem with an account, and what I mean by this is you have a bank account and, you know, maybe you overdrew that bank account and you just closed it or you tried to close it. What happens if that, if that happens to you, and I hope it's not happened to anybody here, but what happens is the bank reports that to Checks Systems. And Checks Systems is a company that identifies banking customers who have stiffed other banks and reports to all the other banks so that banks don't open accounts for you again. And hopefully it doesn't apply again to anyone here, but if you've ever had a problem at a bank, then you can go to checksystems.com and request a customer disclosure report. Find out what you owe and consider paying it off. Because if, if you pay it off, or maybe there's an error and you can dispute the claim, but there are, there are, uh, uh, there are ways to get around this if this happens. And, and the worst case scenario, let's say there is something there, then you have to, and your credit has been hurt by this, then you can, you can find a second chance institution and I am going to put into chat, just in case, again, I hope it doesn't apply, but I'm gonna put into chat a link that will take people uh, a place. If you ever need a second chance institution, this is it. So the second talk topic we're gonna to cover is banking essentials and management. So some of you may already know this, but the two main types of account, uh, accounts we have are checking and savings accounts. So when you open an account at a financial institution, if you have some extra savings, it is likely you'll have a checking and a savings account set up, not just checking. So you can see here the differences between the two. The main way to think about them is that your checking account is the account you use to pay off day-to-day -day transa transactions. On the other hand, your savings account earns more interest and is where you keep your emergency fund and other savings. So it's kind of where you just let your money sit and grow. Or in today's interest rates, not as much, but in the past more so. So going a bit deeper, as mentioned, checking accounts are what you use for day-to-day -day transactions. So if you use a checkbook or a debit card, it'll come directly from this account. If you charge your credit card, you'll be paying that bill at the end of the month using your checking account. So if you have to pay a utility bill or other bills, you may have access to electronic transfers or bill payments using your checking account. And then lastly, when your checking account grows because you are bringing in more than you're spending, you can transfer this from, uh, from your checking account to your savings account or other investment accounts for longer term savings, such as retirement. So as for savings accounts, these are mostly used as your emergency fund, as I mentioned. This is typically three to six months of your expenses, but it can be more depending on your risk tolerance. If you have a goal or a larger expense that you wanna fund in the next, say, three to five years, it would be wise to keep that money in a savings account, as opposed to being invested. That is because if you're expecting to use the money and don't want to have to sell it at a low, like when things dip back in February, uh, then you won't be subject to the market volatility and you'll have your money available for that, whatever that uh, large item expenses. If you're risk averse, you may even want to add some uh, or keep some longer term savings in there as well. But if you can withstand the, vol the volatility of the market, it's typically best to invest for the long term, uh, invest your longer term savings. Lastly, savings accounts have a higher interest rate than, or most likely have a higher interest rate than checking accounts. Um, this amount accrues on a daily basis, but if you're, but you usually pay this amount once a month. Remember back in the day when there was interest? That was a nice, that was nice. Those were good, those were good times. Are you talking about, you don't think 0.6% is enough or a lot? Yeah, I'm curious, I'm curious, does, uh, does anyone have an automated system right now? I mean, is, every, is anyone fully automated? And uh, um, I, I'm, I have some elements of automation, but there's, there's a lot of steps, if you, if you are, you know, or you look at this and you say, I'm automated all but, you know, all but my, you know, all my bills are automated, all my emergency fund is, is funded. And uh, I, I just, the, the long-term part, that part I don't have automated. Just, just pop into the chat and see, I want to see who's automated. Um, there, there are many steps to full automation. I have clients that have everything on auto pay, literally every single bill on auto pay. If it can go to credit card, that's great. Um, if it can go straight from their bank, they do that. Um, sometimes it has to be one or the other, but everything is automatic. And managing the personal finances at that point is just simple. You know, uh, this is the picture. Like they have a, they have 
direct deposit into the checking, little gets moved over into savings. You know, some of them have a separate savings account that covers like annual bills kind of things like property taxes and insurance. And some of them have a, a separate account for emergency fund. About 90% of their bills usually are on auto pay, you know, again, credit card. Then every three or four months, they reach out to me and say, hey, I got extra $2,000. Why don't you put that in? Take that excess and, put, excess and pull it into the portfolio. Um, looks like we got no auto pay and we got someone that's fully automated. That, I, that, that actually really impresses me. I'm, I'm a little afraid to give, to like put my bills, put my Verizon bill directly to a credit card or directly to my bank account. Cause I just, I like to verify, you know, I like to verify that the bill that they're hitting me for is the right one. I also like to, and so you can get, you know, there's, there are steps before full automation, such as you get the bill electronically, you hit a couple buttons and pay it. Um, but I like, I like actually hitting a couple buttons because it keeps me aware of what's, what's going on. Um, uh, but I, I also really appreciate it when people come in and say, my stuff's fully automated. I don't have to, don't have to think about it, which is, that's nice as well. So these steps are, are pretty self-explanatory. Um, we know that setting up direct deposits easy. Most challenging part of this process for me is the setup of the automating the bill pay. Uh, I think that's as, I think the automatic bill pay is the reason that we, once we have a bank, we never change banks because resetting up or re-entering all our bills is kind of a hassle. So, which is, you know, that's why they offer that and we're locked in. Now savings is a matter of setting up internal auto transfers of the accounts, uh, works really well if it's all in one bank. If you have multiple banks, you can ACH, you can set up automatic ACH transfers between them. Um, especially if you have like higher yielding accounts like Marcus or Orange. I think uh, Paul mentioned Allied. Uh, is anyone, does anyone have a bank that's paying 1% on liquid FDIC insurance or FDIC insured account right now? Um, Check the chat. I see that. I see at a time, at the time we were earning 1.5, does anyone have, I'm just curious, because you know, maybe we can all switch our banking, but does anyone have a liquid 1% or more on an FDIC insured? I know there's money markets that pay more than that, but I, you know, I, I have people that, that come to the office and say, yeah, my bank's paying me 1.4, and I go, yeah, you might to look at that again, and it turns out it's like 0 0.8, 0 0.7, because everyone is, everyone's low right now. Finally, uh, and sort of seriously think about this, yeah, it doesn't exist, right? Think about this, if you're part of a family, and or your, your partner and you're the person that handles bills you've got to have an excellent records and reporting system what happens if you're in a car you're the person that handles bills and you're in a car wreck or you know you're sick or whatever and your partner's now in a place where they've got to now manage this what what's been paid what has to be paid where are the bills held like where do they go uh, if they're electronic who gets them do they come into your your email, who, who you know, or, or they come in, come in the mail. So these are all things you have to have sorted out, especially if you're automated. Oh, sorry, especially if you're not automated. Um, uh, knowing where everything is, and if something happens to you, having things set up in advance would be is a huge is a huge benefit. Um, uh, Paul is going to go ahead to, to the next one, and then Paul is going to actually introduce us to debit card versus credit card conversation. Paul. Thanks, Alvin. You can make it purchases using debit and credit cards, as I mentioned. There are pros and cons to both, but we'll review the flow of transactions first. So for a debit card, when you make a purchase, you're using the card that, goes, that comes directly from the financial institution from, in, from your account, if you have the funds, uh, and then it goes to the merchant for you to receive the product or service you bought. So if you don't have the funds, then you have an overdraft fee. On the other hand, with a credit card, you make a purchase with the card and the lender transfers the funds if you have enough credit the merchant for you to receive the product or service you bought. But the extra step is that you must pay the lender at the end of the month, like Jonathan mentioned, or else you uh, begin accruing interest on the credit, which you want to avoid at all costs. No pun intended. So as I said, there are pros and cons to debit and credit cards. With the debit card, it's similar to a check in that money is directly taken from your account at the time of purchase, like I mentioned. This is a pro in that you cannot spend more than you have in your account, but you could be subject to an overdraft fee if you are to if you're not keeping a close eye on the, uh, how much you have in your account. Sometimes banks will also offer deals where debit cards will offer cash back with purchases. So this would obviously be a pro. You can also use a debit card to withdraw cash in an ATM or a bank. Uh, and lastly, the biggest con with a debit card is that you may be subject to unlimited liability if it is stolen. So if you ever lose your card or have the number stolen from you, you want to report that as soon as possible to your financial institution and get a new card.
we're, so with credit cards, it's treated like a loan as opposed to a direct transfer from your bank account. So after you use a credit card, you're then obligated to pay back the loan. And you, if you miss a monthly payment, your you interest that starts accruing, which is typically a high rate, like 20%. So you want to avoid this at all costs. You may also be allowed to get a cash advance with a credit card, but this is typically associated with a large fee. So you want to avoid it if, if, unless you're desperate. The main benefit to credit cards, though, other than building your credit, is that you may be offered rewards such as cash back, which is what I have personally. Um, I know some people like the, the travel miles, but I think it's too much to keep track of. Uh, you also might get discounts or travel miles as well. Um, the biggest con is that you may spend more using your credit card than you have in your bank account. So you want to pay close attention to your spending habits when using one, because you don't want to end up at the end of the month with a $2,000 credit card bill and only have $1,000 in your checking account. Lastly, credit cards offer great protection of stolen and credit card companies have dedicated departments to fraud prevention. So I've had a great experience where things happen to me and the credit card company will pay me back in full and then investigate and figure out what happened and they don't, I'm not on the hook anymore. So there's a huge benefit for having credit cards for that purpose. That's actually something Jennifer was talking about here on the, in the chat as well, was they have that, the issuer between the, the buyer and the, and the, tra and the uh, seller. So it's, it's nice to have that protection. Yeah. So it, I don't know why it just sort of fell this way, but uh, um, Paul got to talk about all the, all the normal stuff and I, and I got to talk about all that emergency uh, repair stuff. So <laughs> you, you guys might not know what this is. I hope, hope again, hopefully no one has to deal with this, but if you're starting out or, or recovering from a credit problem, a secure card can help you rebuild credit. And what, how the secure card works is uh, you basically deposit money into an account and you get a credit card with a limit, the equivalent of the money you deposit. So for example, you deposit 300 bucks into, a, into this account, the company gives you a $300 limit on a credit card, you use that credit card, you slowly build up your, your credit and then you say, you know what, I'm gonna apply for an unsecured card again and you get denied. And so you keep doing it, keep doing it, you, you apply again for an unsecured card and then they approve you and then finally you close that that uh, secured account and you get that $300 back. Um, so that, that's one of the best ways to actually rebuild credit if you've had problems. We've talked a little bit about this already. I'll just cover it pretty quickly again. So debit cards are, are safer in terms of your overspending. Uh, they have a lot of disadvantages in terms of no warranty. Um, they're more hackable, etc. So credit cards have their advantages. There's, there's purchase insurance tied to credit cards. There's the warranty stuff that we just talked about. They're very convenient as long as you pay them off every month and as long as you don't use them to overspend. The big risk with credit cards, the thing that you really have to be wary of, and in our society more than anything, given you know, Amazon's ability to fulfill whatever wish you want within an hour, um, the big risk is overspending on credit cards. So if, if, if you uh, have a tendency to overspend, one of the best tools to keep yourself from doing that is a debit card and to cut your credit cards up. If you have the ability to uh, you know, stay on the, stay on the path, uh, then you can use your credit card and pay it off every single month. So I guess I'm going to go into building a trusted team. And I just want to add that I think in the more extreme measures, you don't use a debit card, right? You just go to like the cash and envelope system. Right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Ideally it would be best to have a financial advisement team to help guide you through major life decisions when it comes to your finances. But if you do not use one of these team members and you're more of a do it yourself, then make sure you're well-versed in what you're doing. For example, some people use TurboTax and do not outsource these type of financial tasks. But if you don't know what you're doing and your, or your circumstances get more complicated, it is best to surround yourself with trusted individuals who can help you with taxes, insurance, financial planning, investments, real estate, and other areas that you see here. So the first one you see here is a contact that a financial institution is helpful or important to have when, you know, and help to help you uh, if, if and when fraud arises, disputes in transactional history come up, or just to keep you apprised of the offers with an institution, such as a higher interest rate account. This may not be one specific person, it could be, but it could also be the service team at the bank. So if you don't get a dedicated person to assist you, you'll want to ask how the uh, available the service team is and how that um, they help in the case of transaction disputes and fraud. I think this is the worst case scenario that can come up. So it's important that, that you have people to support you if and when this arises. Otherwise, you'll want to get general feeling that they are friendly and provide good, uh, good customer support or service. A financial mentor is 
someone who's a family member or a friend or someone in your community that you seek out and gain guidance from, it is typically someone who you view as being successful with her or his money and you want to learn from. For a financial mentor, if you are undecided about who that should be, you want to ask potential people about their philosophy on money and how they've made or retained their money. I believe it is important that you align to this person in regards to your philosophy about money and somewhat of a similar background. Otherwise, it may be hard to build trust and connect with this individual. So for example, if you're, let's say, frugal or don't view money as a status, as a status symbol, not saying there's anything wrong with that, but some people don't. And you're also, let's say, self-employed. You may be wise to find someone who has a similar background to you to help provide guidance on how to succeed when it comes to finances. Now, let's say someone enjoys spending their money and they see money as a form of status and they're, let's say, a government employee and not self-employed and they don't know it's like to run a business or be a freelance freelancer, then it may be hard to relate to his or her su financial successes. Now, a tax planner is someone who's a CPA or an EA or an enrolled agent who can be beneficial to help you file correctly and pay taxes on time without penalty or reduce your tax burden as much as possible. Some people like to do their own taxes, like I mentioned, but if you decide to choose someone, you'll want to know their credentials, how long they've been practicing, and ask how they will help you reduce your tax burden, tax burden given your specific circumstances, because you kind of want to understand the value you're getting out of it. Tax advisors are stereotypically not the most social people, so you'll want to feel comfortable communicating with this individual as well, especially considering that this person will need to be responsive uh, with deadlines. And I know I made a stereotype, but I've heard tax advisors tell me that themselves as well. Lastly, totally true. It's totally true. <laughs> and lastly, with an insurance agent, uh, they're vital to ensure that you have proper coverage for the different risks you have in life, uh, such as your car, property, or life insurance. When it comes to an insurance provider, a person could be helpful, but sometimes you may find yourself getting insurance products from multiple brokers or companies. So what is most important is that you do not work with someone who's pushing a product because they earn a commission. That is why it's important that you work with a financial planner, and I'm a little biased in this, but to help you identify the different insurance you may need, and then you can get in touch with an insurance broker who will shop around for the best price for you once the product has been identified. There's also a cost benefit sometimes to get, or discounts you can get when you get insurance through one provider, such as home and auto. Like I think I get that with my provider through State Farm. But uh, the decision on which provider to go with should come down to the cost of the policy, the customer service, and more specifically, the process of submitting a claim and getting paid. because I know some places take forever or they're not responsive and it's a pain and it's important, like if you get an auto accident to get that payment um, soon so you can get back on the road. And then lastly, it's important to know the AM best rating of the insurance company. Uh, and this is the rating of the company's financial strength and the issuer, issuer credit. So that's just important to know that you're gonna get paid out. And I was actually talking to Jonathan before a presentation about this and um, I think it's more, it's more important for things like um, natural disasters, I believe, and not like maybe life insurance. Is that correct, Jonathan? Uh, you mean you mean AM, the AM best reading? Yeah, or just yeah, in terms of. Um, I mean, I, I think it's insurance, so I think you want to you just want to go with a, a relatively uh, highly rated insurance carrier, no matter what kind of insurance you're buying. That's the safest way to do it. Yeah. Okay. I just, uh, uh, it's something that, something that you said uh, regarding insurance. So we, we write financial plans for people all the time. I mean, we, we have new clients, a couple new clients a month. Uh, we write a financial plan and, and we'll say to the, to the client, uh, you need this kind of insurance and they'll go talk to a, an insurance broker. It's not 100%, but a good 80% of the time, they get upsold something that we did, we, you know, the insurance broker almost always tries to suggest something else. Hey, have you thought about this? Whereas we've just, we've gotten done this entire planning process uh, and, and the insurance company gets paid, the insurance broker gets paid by commission. So it's, it's just, it's really, it's really good idea, like Paul said, to do a plan first and know what's appropriate and to actually know what you want to get when you go talk to an insurance person, because there's always a reason or a new writer or a new thing or it's that, that makes it, oh, maybe I should do that. It's a very attractive thing. And that's, that's kind of how insurance gets sold. Um, uh, so just be wary when you're buying insurance. So John Madden, who's here with us, regales us uh, with stories about working with a college planner for his daughters. Now, it's, it's partially, obviously, about the ROI of education, but it's also about finding the right college experience for your kids. You know, are they, are they D1 kind of kids? They want to go with a, uh, with a school with 50,000 students? Or are they, 
uh, are they better fit for a thousand student liberal arts education? Uh, and, and college planners can also help you get, get the funding part squared away as well. Where, where are some specialty um, scholarships to apply for, et cetera. Now, the three big questions to ask a college planner are, you know, do you have a relationship with specific colleges or are you more, you know, broadly, you know, broadly apply your, your trade? Uh, what are your fees? You know, how do they charge? And can you advise me about the scholarships as well? Some of them don't do the funding part. If you're looking for an attorney, you know, this is obviously very invaluable if you, you know, run a business, any contract discussion or review. Uh, the ones we work with the most are estate planning attorneys, and there's three good questions to ask an attorney. Uh, what percentage of your practice is cases like mine? In other words, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that are business attorney, estate planning attorneys, and they do, you know, they do 50% business, maybe 60% business, and 40% estate planning. So they're not they're not specialists in estate planning. If you have a complex estate plan, you want to actually have an, a specialist who does specifically what you want. You want to ask about their fees. And you want to know if they're going to handle it or if they're going to hand you off to someone else in their office to handle it. Um, you may also, you know, we're in the Bay Area, so uh, real estate is, is core holding, like our houses are worth more than most places. Um, so you may use a realtor or a mortgage broker at some time. So I've, I've literally used the same mortgage broker for 30 years. So uh, anytime they put something in front of me, I got to sign, it's actually really easy because I totally trust them. I know that they've looked at it already. Uh, and another advantage of some of these folks is uh, our realtor, and actually, you know, John's wife is a good example of this, has contacts with every type of service you might ever need. Um, so realtors are a fantastic community hub. Uh, if you ever need a resource, a roofer, a plumber, you know, electrician, I think John has given me referrals to, you know, a dozen different kind of, you know, someone to do my trees, someone that does the yard, so just all kinds of stuff. Um, but the top three questions to ask them, how many clients do you work with at one time? How well do you know the neighborhood that I work in? That's specifically for a realtor. And specifically for a mortgage person is, have you ever had any disciplinary action taken against you? It's good to know those things um, for sure. Now, not everyone needs, and I'm gonna say this, and I'll get maybe some disagreement, not everyone needs a financial advisor. Obviously, anyone in these classes you know, knows that our day job is to help people match their financial resources with their financial objectives kind of staying true to their values and then and, and i know none of you would ever think about interviewing other advisors but just in case we aren't your cup of tea uh you should look for someone who focuses on education and planning and admits that they can't predict markets no, no one no one can predict markets and it's harder to find people who will admit that than you might think uh, some great questions to ask are are you a fiduciary do you work with clients like me and what are the certifications or what's the, what's your experience like? And then obviously, how are you compensated? These are good questions for a financial advisor. Go ahead. And we had a question in the chat, Jonathan, about insurance. It says, any advice on buying earthquake insurance? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, John. Um, I tell you, I didn't have it for a long time. Now I have it. I think that's probably the best, the best I can say. It's, it's very, the problem with earthquake insurance is it's very expensive and there's almost always a really big deductible. Uh, it gets more and more and more important to have earthquake insurance. The small, the, the more of your house you own. Like if you just bought the house, you have an FHA loan and you put a 3%, you know, 3% down on it, then maybe I wouldn't buy earthquake insurance because the, you know, the, the, um, uh, the out of pocket will be higher than the, the amount of value I have in the house. But if you get to that age where you're, you know, the house is paid off, then I would absolutely have earthquake insurance in earthquake country for sure. Um, anywhere in between there, it's, it's a conversation about the bigger picture, I think. You, wanna, you want anyone you work with to be professional and experienced with clients like you. You want them to always work in your best interests. That's the fiduciary responsibility. Um, it's great if your advisory group tells good stories, but that's not enough. They need to be qualified looking out for you. And a couple, a couple little stories in 2006, 2008, you know, mortgage brokers got lots of people into really crappy mortgages and, and everyone was doing the wrong things. Then people were buying too much house, but mortgage brokers were part of that. And so you just want to be really careful that this person, and I, I remember my mortgage broker um, when I bought my first place, it, it's never about, it's never about, can I afford this 
mortgage. It's if, if the variable rate goes up, can I still afford it? What's the worst case scenario in this mortgage? And can I afford it if that happens? And you remember some of those crazy loans that were being offered in 2006 and 2007 before the Great Recession, they shouldn't have been offered because people didn't understand them at all. Um, so having something you trust and, and is looking out for you is important. Also, 2008, you guys remember this, but Goldman Sachs actually bet against their own clients, the clients they were advising. Um, you know, I spent, I spent a lot of years at Wall Street firms. In fact, you know, uh, John was at, John was there with me once and I worked with Scott and a couple others. Um, I, I don't know if it surprises them. It doesn't surprise me one bit that that would happen. Um, so it pays actually to, to take out and take a look at some of these things uh, and some of the big frauds and understand how these things happen. I realize this one was shorter than some of the others. So we're happy to answer questions about this stuff. We're happy to answer questions about uh, anything we've covered you know, before as well. You know, the whole thing on, on when you're talking about a lot of this stuff is there's deals out there that are too good to be true. Yeah. And that's, it's, you know, beware. Yeah. Yeah. And they've, and it's, it's interesting over the last, I don't know, over the last 20 years, they've changed you know, how you use credit cards becomes really important because they've changed bankruptcy laws to make it harder to declare bankruptcy. They've changed things to make it harder on the smaller guy, make it easier on the banks and things. So, you know, picking your bank is really important. Um, you know, Gee, that sounds familiar. Is that part of our politics? I, yeah, well, this is not just the last four years, Jim. This is, this is going back 20 years. <laughs> yeah. It's a steady, progressive. Both year. parties are guilty. Both parties are guilty. There's a lot of trade-offs. The financial lobby is a strong lobby. It's a it's very the money. powerful lobby. I have to know that banks admit that they make mistakes too, Jennifer. Thanks for saying that. Um, there's, you know, sometimes somebody somebody goes in and is working on a program and things, you know, things will get transposed. I went that long back when I was working at V of A a long time ago. Um, there was a guy who was trying to flip off some of the mills into his own, you know, the the points behind the decimal, and it was it was quite a while ago into his own account. He got caught and was marched, you know, security walked him out, but. Um, you know, uh, sometimes just, you know, automatic things will get screwed up. You know, there, there, there's always programmers behind this. So it's worth remembering that. It, that, that story sounds like office space. Isn't that precisely what they did in office space? Uh, it might have been, although this was long before office space was ever done. This is like the late seventies back in, back in main, mainframe era. Huh. But, um, it's amazing. you know, that's the, the one grain of rice in each one of the boxes on the in the chessboard yeah. with that fraction yeah. of the middle. You know, but it's like, you know, four decimal, you know, four, four, four or five decimal or even 10 decimal places out. It's, but it's, you know, it's, it's like little, you know, billions of bits of, billions of bits of anything will add up. I mean, that's how, the, the, that's how Facebook makes its money. Yep, that's true. Another you question. ask a question about- I had a question. Um, the mortgage lender. Um, so I th actually, John you, you, and, and Paul, you actually had this one, but I, I have some thoughts about it. I think that if you, if you have a mortgage lender, you, you want to, there's two different kinds of mortgage lenders. Like you can go to the bank and the bank has the bank's products. You can go to a mortgage broker and the mortgage yeah. broker has, um, I, I would always recommend somebody go to a mortgage broker over a bank. Okay. You get, you get a much broader idea of what's, what's possible and they can they can actually shop around to look for specific things for you so the first the first thing is the lender is it directly to a bank or to a specific lending institution or to a mortgage broker highly recommend the mortgage broker every single time um, and then and then the second thing is when you go in and talk to them you want to know you know do they have three banks that they work with or do they have a variety of banks that they work with and they should be able to present to you a basic rate sheet and that rate sheet should should give you like a uh, a sense of uh, all the different programs and the different rates you can expect and the points you might expect to pay. And, um, and then, and then the way it works now, there's actually a lot less variability than there was 10, 12 years ago in this. A, a mortgage broker has to set the same rate now for every single customer. So some mortgage mortgage brokers charge 0.5%, some charge 0.75%, uh, some charge 1%. 
So that question, you can ask them, hey, what do you charge for your mortgage brokerage services? Um, it's, they're gonna give you a, a percentage number and you might find someone that's a little cheaper, but if they're between that 0.5 and one, that's, that's pretty much normal. Um, if you hear someone that's charging you two, you can find someone cheaper for sure. Um, but, but the first thing is, do they have a breadth of mortgages they can offer? Um, just like we talked about in some of the other ones, do they, do they work in, in the types of mortgages you need? Like if you're, if they're, uh, um, if you're going to get an FHA loan, is that something they do on a, on a regular basis or are they always shopping it out to <clears throat> bigger banks? What, what is it specifically? Are they looking for multi-million dollar loans or is it the, the $500,000 loan? What, what is their specialty? Um, but I think that that gives you a lot of the a range of questions you might want to ask. I just spoke to a mortgage lender this past weekend and this weekend we're speaking to a realtor. So this is a perfect timing and a mortgage lender came to us through a friend of mine and we, we also heard like Chase does a really good mortgage also. So we just have like maybe abundant of information and we just weren't sure how to make the best decision, who to go to and what to ask them. So it is very helpful. I, did, I haven't even looked into mortgage broker and that sounds like that's what you're recommending. So just a follow-up question to that is, do you have someone that you recommend? Like, is it like a national thing or mm -hmm. if it's a local thing, like I should look for somebody in local. Portland, Oregon because local. that's where I live. Okay. Local, Segura, local. Well, okay. John, John, doesn't, I mean, doesn't RPM, aren't they? We have, we, have, we use a guy at RPM and I think that's a national firm. Yes, but uh, I think what what I heard was you, you wouldn't want to use our guy here in no. Berkeley to represent her in Portland. No, um, definitely not. But you might you might want to you might want to get an introduction. He might know somebody and get an introduction yeah. up there. Yeah, something That's important about the local part is that you want someone local because you want the loan to be available and ready to pay for your offer. You don't want the deal to go through because your loan's not coming through. So. Well, and also the Contra real estate agent, uh, your, your offer, if it's from out of state or someone that they don't know, it's not going to carry the same weight right. as another buyer saying, oh, well, I'm using, you know, Joe Smith and the realtor. Well, yeah, everybody knows Joe Smith. He's mm -hmm. really reliable. He'll get the, 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 the job done. Right. Yeah, it's very local. Mm-hmm. Great well, advice, we, thank you. We've, we've had good luck with RPM, and if there's an RPM office there, that's a, that's a good firm. Yeah, yeah. RPM, uh, yeah, R like Robert, P like Paul, M like Mary, RPM. Yeah. And just know this isn't for searching for one, but they'll prove up to 35 to 40% of your income, I believe, for a mortgage, so just be wary of, you can go as high as that, and you don't want to go as high as that, in my opinion. Yep, good planning, good planning advice. I would be glad of a few words on bank politics. We, we are in a new city, Portland, where which has a terrible racial history in so many regards. And you know, we are aware that there was a lot of redlining, a lot of subprime mortgaging. But you know, is there, without talking about specific banks, is there a source of information? I mean, I, I want a reliable, I don't know, consumer reports that will tell me these banks have behaved well over the years. These have, have had problems, not so much financial problems as the uh, behavioral problems dealing with how they deal with their clients. So I, I don't have a, I don't have like a, a consumer financial protection bureau answer for you, but I have a client who is, I would say he's a communist activist <laughs> and he lives in Portland. And I will ask him where he banks, and I will guarantee you that he's the, he he banks at the one that's the that's the least bad. This is just the kind of information we will be glad to have. <laughs> Thank you. I'll talk to him about it, and I'll and I'll get back to you, John. Please. I got to make a note on that one. I, I, there there have been some books written uh, in the last couple of years. I think in the last eighteen months on the. The history of redlining in America, and I think it goes state to state. Um, you could probably look up and see what's, you know, from that author, what's what's in that book. And uh, I, I think they probably name names. I'd, I'd, have, to, I'd have to look up, the, I'd have to look up um, who it was, but I, 
I, I think it was like last last fall that the book was published. I, I think that it's it's likely that any bank that is in existence that was in existence then participated in redlining. I, I don't think there's probably any banks, but thankfully new banks are born all the time. So yeah. you have banks that are newer that weren't even weren't around then. That's probably your best bet. Credit unions are almost always better actors in the community. Um, credit unions come in two different flavors. They come in like a credit union that's specific to um, an airbase or to a bank or to, not a bank. Bank's a bad example. Uh, uh, Fire, firefighter, please. Firefighters, credit, yeah. Credit unions are specific to a, a, a specific group of people. Um, but there's also credit unions that are specific for low income. Like um, in Berkeley, the what is it? The Cooperative Center Federal Credit Union is yeah, the specific co for lower income people um, and that's that's what their services are designed for and it's it's designed for so you find you can find that kind of a thing of a credit union in portland that would work my assumption is that's what you know my client i'm mentioning will will bring up uh, but I'll, I'll ask him and i'll get back to you uh, and it, you're looking for a newer bank a bank that's a green bank a bank that's you know a better actor because i i think that the, unfortunately the redlining was just a fact of banking it was, and it was, it was, it was supported by the federal government. It was, it was just a fact of banking. I'm wondering in like the socially responsible funds and the ESG funds, what bank or financial would show up in those portfolios? Because those are the ones that are actually doing things properly, I would guess, currently. And everybody oh. else would be left out. Paul, introduce what you just popped in there. I was just looking online to see if any, any sort of association that governs this. And I, the closest thing I could find was, Certified B Corps, and then also a member of the Global Alliance of, for Banking on Values. And so they focus on, it looks like, um, supporting the planet, people, and profit. That's our, and then community investments, transparency and business practices, sustainability, long-term relationships with clients, and formal internal policies to uphold the previous time. Do they give you names or do they just give you how to find At the bottom, them? there's some, yeah. Like in California and Oregon, there's one called Beneficial State Bank. Uh, new, out of the name. Another one in California called New Resource Bank, and there are You know them, John? You know New Resource. New Resource yeah. is here. Yeah, New Resource is in San Francisco. Yeah. Amalgamated, amalgamated actually is one that's everywhere. I've seen that one before. Yeah, New Resource is San Francisco. I think amalgamated. I think amalgamated actually purchased New Resource Bank. I don't think New Resource Bank is is uh, is a separate company anymore. I think they were purchased by amalgamated. I think we should let everybody get into their Thursday evening. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you for attending. See you next time. Bye-bye.